We're gonna get started with the next session, which is system planning. And I'd like to introduce Leah Caffeine. She's the Director of Fundamentals at Pattern Energy Group. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining uh, systems planning panel. Uh, we have a great panel today. I'm really excited. I got a chance to talk to everybody, um, you know, uh, two weeks ago, and I just got really excited for everything we're going to discuss today. So we have a good mix of system planners, and then also um, researching researchers, software tools. You know, everything is evolving. It's all got to evolve together, kind of as our planning approach to planning is changing. So does the tools that support it have to change along with it. Um, you know, really driven by the new technology that we're considering when we're doing system planning, large loads, really hot topic. Um, and, you know, with large loads, electrification, really like separating those out as two separate items that we have to think about going forward. Um, so we're gonna start today. Um, I'm kind of just gonna give people a few minutes to get situated because you don't want to miss this. Um, I got really, <laughs> what's that? Yeah, yeah. Um, we're gonna get started today with Steve. Um, Steve is the Vice President of Integrated Planning at Excel Energy. Um, when I talked to Steve, I was like, it was a very exciting conversation. I was like, are you sure you work at Excel? I was like, this is very exciting. So you guys are doing some really great, um, interesting like really like from the corporate structure you change your corporate structure to be able to accomplish what you need to accomplish you know for for your rate pairs um so it's it's very interesting to see this sort of cross-sectional planning de-siloing across the organization um to deal with the challenges that you see on the horizon so i'm going to hand it over to steve um to kind of take you through what's going on over at excel energy All right, everybody hear me okay? Wonderful. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, very excited to be here um, with this panel with, with, uh, with Leah. Um, this is my first time at ESIG, and I'm also newly elected to the board, so I'm very excited about uh, participating in ESIG. Um, this is a really interesting group, and I get the opportunity to travel around the country and, frankly, the world um, to talk about energy. and. Um, I have to say, I, it was a breath of fresh air walking around the eSig event over the last couple of days because I don't know about you guys, but I'm really tired of like the buzzwords that are out there, like AI. I go into a conference a couple of weeks ago and that's all everybody talked about. Like if you made it a drinking game, you'd be in the hospital within minutes um, talking about AI or, uh, you know, machine learning and things like that. And, you know, before that, you know, Q1, Q2 of 2023, you know, the buzz was the IRA. Again, you made a drinking game out of it, you'd be dead in minutes. And so uh, I, like to, I like this team, uh, this group, because, you know, I kind of, let me adjust that. All right, hopefully, yeah, that's a little better. Um, I like this group because you guys are talking about the stuff that keeps me up at night and is interesting to me. So you know, just walking in between like, you know, the, the main resort and here, you know, I'll hear people on their cell phones talking about reserve margins and ELCC. So I'm like, hell yeah, like, that's sweet. You're not, you're not just talking a whole bunch of, uh, you know what there. So, uh, you know, I'd say the main thing that I've learned to date so far um, throughout the conference though, is that the bicycle leadership conference is a thing. And I got to call our industry out, you guys, we do not dress cool, like blue, gray like we're kind of boring those guys are like in backwards hats hoodies lots of shorts um i don't lie i made a lot i questioned a lot of my life decisions last night going to bed wondering like huh i wonder if i should have gone into the mountain biking industry that, that seems pretty fun so no offense but i thought it was kind of an interesting juxtaposition uh mountain bike uh, cycling industry versus energy so uh like uh like we teed up here today yeah, I was a little bit concerned because I was listening to the presentations over the last couple of days and I was like, holy moly, I don't think I'm technical enough. Um, so I, I think my other panelists will cover that. I'm here to kind of hit, I think, a little bit more like the higher level, you know, cultural piece, right? The organizational shift. Um, this is just as important. Um, 
Integrated planning is something that the entire industry is talking about. It's the buzz of just about everything going on, right? And I, I talked to a lot of consultancies. I talked to a lot of vendors. I talked to a lot of other utilities, again, across the globe. And everybody's doing something along these lines. I, I will attempt to differentiate this. And I appreciate that the lead up, you're right. We are boring, but this is kind of exciting. What makes us novel and interesting is we're the first big company to actually write the check to do integrated planning. And what I mean by that, and what I'll talk you through, is we physically moved people, we collapsed our own silos, we challenged our own organization, and then we wrote a 20 plus million dollar check to figure out how to do integrated system planning. And that is all o &M. So if you know anything about how utilities operate, right, o &M is 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 king. That's how most utilities are driven. Just put that in perspective, you know, our, our o &M budgets are Few, a couple billion dollars so for us like this is a big deal like this is something we're doing at a lot of recovery risk a lot of regulatory risk but it's partly what we need to do for our customers so we like to start with this slide right this is kind of the picture this is the vision and we use this slide in a lot of board materials talking to our regulators etc one of the things i'm the most proud of and i won't lie i, I landed on deciding i'm really happy with my career decisions I'm happy to be in, in energy even though mountain biking is so exciting and this slide is, is that reason. We make the most important product on the planet, period. I'd even go one step further. We make the most important product that's ever been made in the history of mankind. So just quick history lesson, right? Think about the several hundred thousand millennia that humans have existed. Think about where we were in the 1700s, the 1800s, even the 1900s, the first half of the century, right? This tremendous outgrowth of technology of prosperity, of health, health spans, lifespans, is all a result of cheap, reliable, and abundant energy. And that's something that everybody in this room produces. We do it day in, day out. We do it 24 seven, we do it 365. When you look at this map, right, what you see, it's, it's obviously a map of the world at night where you see color, you see lights, you see all those things I just enumerated, right? Wealth, prosperity, advancement, um, you know, things like that, economic growth, all these, all these other industries um, are a result of our ability to lean into um, a very healthy grid. So we're on a precipice, right? We're a hundred plus year old in, uh, industry. Uh, I think the history of utilities is absolutely fascinating, right? Most of us started as lighting companies or some version of that. Um, you know, I know for us in particular, we are a lighting company. We were a steam company. Uh, I've seen actually documents from um, like J. Paul Getty, signed um, we've got stuff that uh, like oil leases from back in the day that uh, that rockefeller signed um, we've been around for a long time we have a history of innovation and we're in that same window right now um, as i see it the grid has benefited tremendously from the initial um built the initial couple build outs um right so our, our forebearers they did a great job building capacity onto the grid and since capacity comes in tranches um, it's, it's kind of been easy, right? So the first major gr uh, grid build out, right? The first kind of bits of electrification to like basic lighting, some basic appliances in the 1920s and 30s that got us the first tranche of capacity. The next big revolution came with air conditioning, it came in the 50s, 60s and 70s, right? Huge, huge outgrowth of, of population growth as well coming out of World War II, right? The grid kept, kept up with that. Starting in the 70s, you kind of hit this like saturation inflection point for air conditioning and then what have we all been doing since then? We've been riding the coattails of things like energy efficiency, declining sales, all these other things that have kind of created this like very risk averse kind of, you know, uncertain energy industry. And then now we're being tasked with this whole new world, right? This revolution. I mean, DER has been going on for a while, but, you know, the huge proliferation of solar. And while it's been going on for a while since, you know, in the 90s, early 2000s, I mean, that's five minutes in the world of utilities, right? We've been operating for 100 years. Um, we don't unfortunately change that quickly. So you, you're starting with DERs. The next thing you have is obviously electrification of so many other pieces of, of your, your average consumer's lifestyle. EVs, beneficial electrification for heating, data center growth, right? You all could name it probably better than I could. So we're, we're sitting on this precipice, which kind of tees up this question of how do you do this, right? How do you use the assets that you have? How do you leverage those to create the vision for the future and this whole energy revolution, right? And as I like to challenge my team, we say that we're an energy revolution all the time, right? It's our job, it's our impetus to make that exciting and not boring, to not fall into the traps of, of how utilities have liked to do things in the past. So a quick Excel 101 thing here, um, this is a little bit of what we look, look like. We're in eight states, um, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, 
UP of Michigan, Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas. Uh, the red is our service territory. We look, we generally serve the major markets in those areas. Our 80% of our revenue is going to come from oil and gas in, in New Mexico, right? So we serve the Permian Basin, the Denver mass market, and the Twin Cities mass market. That's, that's about 80% of our revenue. Um, from an asset perspective, um, we're fully integrated um, and we're vertically integrated. Um, we're also fully regulated. So that makes us pretty unique when you kind of look at like the top 10 utility stocks that are in the market, right? It's, it's hard to compare us to like a next era. Um, next has got a very healthy unregulated business. We have a fully regulated, um, hold co business basically is, is how we're set up. Um, numbers a little bit out of date. It's probably more like $45 billion in rate base. And we own approximately 120, uh, generating plants. And what I think is interesting about us too, is when you kind of look at like the span of our service territory, we kind of got a little bit of everything. So we've got a little bit of hydro, we've got some nukes, we've got coal, we've got gas, we've got made a lot lots of wind in fact some of the biggest wind plants um, that are now 20 30 years old um, in our territory the thing that strikes me when i look at our, our at our position in the country though is we're in the upper midwest we're in the great plains and then we're in the southwest we have the best renewable resources available to us of any utility in the country and i would would welcome that argument if, if you want to have it uh, when you look at what we have in terms of resource zones, the most reliable wind, the most reliable solar, and it's our job to kind of maximize that for customers. So again, it kind of keeps teasing up this piece of why are we doing this? How do we do this? So our vision, right? This is our, our vision for who we want to be as a, as a utility for our consumers. And here's our, our part to play our picture is we want to offer zero carbon emissions electricity by 2050. We want to offer net zero gas service by 2050, and we want to help saturate 100% zero carbon transportation by 2050. There's also some interim 2030 goals in there. So what that means is we've quickly developed a hypothesis that if you leave it to how we do things today, we'll quickly run out of money. Our consumers will quickly run out of money. Finance is zero sum. It, it's kind of that simple. And when you look at like any of like the kind of long-term 2050 pathways analysis, there's plenty that are out there. I know Bloomberg's done some, uh, EPRI has done some, right? With the region analysis, um, there, there's, there's, you'll find that there's a, there's a range of anywhere from like 10 to about $30 trillion of capital infusion that has to come into this industry. in the next 25, 30 years, we wanna hit our 1.5 degrees Celsius target coming out of IPCC and the Paris Agreement. So when I think about how that kind of divides up amongst our customers, right, it's, again, it's kind of simple finance. I mean, there's about 400 million Americans. The average utility bill is about $120. You kind of do the backwards math and you say, okay, I need a, wait. I don't know what's up with that. Let's see if I can rectify it. It's not on my screen. I'll keep going. Um, so, you know, we need to basically inject about a trillion dollars about every other year or so into our economy to make this, this clean uh, energy revolution occur and to meet all of our load growth needs. Um, it also means though, that it's not just a, a free capital spigot of money. It also means that if we fail to do this, if we have to do any of that twice, right? The price tag just keeps going up. And where we're at, you know, as I think utilities have become, have become interesting, generally for a household, we're like the second or third largest standing bill behind a mortgage, behind a car payment. And so our consumers are taking a lot more interest in where their energy is coming from. And I got a great, you know, kind of learning moment, uh, an insight from an executive that I was meeting with at Maybelline, the cosmetic. I don't know anything about cosmetics for the record. Uh, but what he taught me is, I guess they're kind of like a mid-tier brand. They're sold in like Target and whatnot. And they had a really big problem with declining sales over the last 20 years. And what they were doing wrongly is they're thinking about their market incorrectly, right? They're kind of making assumptions based on, all right, these are the demographics of people who buy our product. We think this is their income bracket. We think this is how they, how they look at our, our product from a marketing perspective. And they had actually had to launch a multi, you know, two to three year long investigation to examine actual customer insights. And what they discovered is that there's a lot of intergenerational differences in terms of how people think about their products. Baby boomers think about this differently than Gen X then millennials, then Gen Z, then I think it's Gen Alpha or Zillennials. Um, so whatever's after that, they all, they all work and think about the world and process the world differently. And Maybelline's keen insight is you get to about millennials, or sorry, you get to about Gen X and millennials. These are people, and I'm in this group. Um, we generally don't know life without the internet. Um, we are used to having abundant access to information 365, 24, seven. So what does that mean? And I'm guessing every single one of you are guilty in this room. You have a question, what do you do? You Google it. Right off the bat, you pull out your phone, 
you're talking to someone, I don't know what that term was, look it up, you know, try to try to fake your way through the conversation. Oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. I'm gonna look this up. We're all used to that. It also means though that the impetus in terms of being transparent and allowing con uh, consumer interaction with our product has increased dramatically, right? This is just the new expectation for people wanting to know where energy comes from, to participate, to have their own assets, right? As part of the grid uh, uh, reconstruction. And uh, it's really required us to challenge ourselves to think about, you know, how do we move from the old utility model of, you know, just pay your hundred bucks. We'll have a rate case about it. We're going to do some things in this regulatory environment. We're going to hire a lot of lawyers. It's really mysterious. No one understands their bill. Right. And then if you could just pay $110 the next time, that'd be really lovely. Like that's just not going to fly. That's not going to work. It's this whole new world of transparency and really starting with the vision creating the principles behind the vision, right? And then allowing multiple streams for our consumers to engage. So high level, if we don't do that right, if we misallocate the capital, right? We don't create a process to do this well. Our view is that our rates will run away. And considering where we're at in terms of supply chain pressures across the, across the country, inflationary pressures, right? We've all experienced this when we've gone to the grocery store, bought a car, et cetera. Given everything, right? The premises I just laid out before, we are directly in the line of sight of how people think about the construct of capitalism, right? The institution of capitalism, the institutional uh, nature of debt, the institutional nature of how people think about consumer choice and consumer products. So that's our impetus. That's our part to play. That's our imperative. That's why we must change and change quickly. So quick utility orientation. This is how we normally operate. Um, you've got enterprise, which is kind of like everybody else, CFO, HR, IT, et cetera. Um, a lot of these teams are usually associated with four letter words. Uh, you have the operating companies, that's like jurisdictional affairs, right? That's rate cases, government affairs, account management, stuff like that. And then you've got operations. And this is kind of the bread and butter of utilities, right? We own assets and we operate assets. Um, so typically the way we're organized is we'd have like a senior executive over each of these business units, transmission, energy supply, distribution, gas, we created one for clean fuels. And that person would have end-to-end end -end responsibilities. They do strategy, they do planning, they do regulatory, they do capital execution, operations, et cetera. Going back to our premise, right? We gotta get better at capital allocation. We can't afford to do it twice. We have to integrate more. We quickly realized that we gotta change the structure. And so what we did is we created ISP. And this is about a two-year old, two old organization now, actually this May. Uh, we've all been our, in our roles for a little bit of time. Um, we basically took the, the front half of that value chain that I just described, right? That was underneath, underneath each of those commodity leaders. We parsed it out and said, okay, there's now a centralized hub for planning and execution. And this is actually not a new or, or design. Actually, we shamelessly stole this from two, two areas. This is like kind of like the, the playbook for nuclear organizational design. You'll find this in IMPO and student nuclear power operations. This is a, a gold standard for how you think about effective organizational development. And also uh, North Sea and offshore oil field operations. This is also how they organize. You, you keep strategy separate, you keep engineering separate, you keep execution separate. The reason is you, you need to preserve the consciousness of each of those things, the foundational principles at the highest level of the organization. So if you think about it, right, going back a minute, if you've got someone say over distribution, that person could be an engineer, right? They're gonna have a bias for engineering stuff. They're gonna make a ah, capital execution I don't care about. Financials I don't care as much about. Regulatory imperative I don't care as much about, right? You can kind of create these biases. On the flip side, you put a lawyer over that business. Eh, I don't really care as much about engineering. You know, I, I know what you're saying, Mr. Engineer, but I don't, I don't really agree. It sounds expensive. I don't want to get eaten, eaten alive by a regulator. So what this lets us do is it creates and lets us preserve and, and frankly revere a strategic and technical consciousness at the very highest level of the organization directly into the ear of the board of directors, which then goes back to our CEO, which goes back to our chief planning officer. It's like that, that little cycle. So we did that very intentionally to create this, this preservation, this, this, this reservation. So in effect, what this does, it creates two, two centers of excellence for us. It lets our COO, right, uh, uh, execute. And basically the way he puts it is I want to install the valve and I want to turn the valve. I want to install the recloser. I want to turn the recloser. That's it. Our team tells them where to put it, what kind to put in, how to put it in, et cetera. So that, that's kind of like the division of responsibilities. So this is kind of like our, our products, if you will, right? And the first thing is to create a long-term integrated plan that really commingles generation, transmission, distribution, and gas. That's my, that's my team. I'll talk about what ISP looks like in a minute. But that's one of our products is we want one playbook that we're operating off of 
versus these like little bespoke regulatory filings that kind of get you know cluttered along the way. We need to create a long-term rate analysis that goes out to 2050 that can really conclude and help differentiate um, the, the true cost of this, uh, of this energy revolution and also kind of defeat some of the lore that's out there. I'm of the camp that I'm actually not convinced that all data centers are good load. And that's kind of a controversial thing to say. Typical utility operation is all load is good load. I am of the opinion, I think data centers are kind of cost causers. And given their extraordinarily high capacity factors, you know, you're going to build marginal capacity to meet their needs. You don't necessarily get the, you know, the talent that we want to build internally versus the talent that we want to buy from consultancies and from OEMs and things like that. We then actually physically moved all the people. So we relocated people. We changed jobs. We put that into the new ISP structure. Uh, we went through a process of deploying our new organizational roadmaps for integrated planning. And then now we're kind of on this iterative part where we're trying to optimize, create efficiencies, you know, ensure that the operation stuff stays with operations, planning stays with, with us. So what this looks like is this is kind of the planning cycle. And the quick analogy that, that I'll use is basically it looks like uh, designing a house. So working from left to right, right, we start with origination, right? That's all the customer trends. What's going on with load growth? What's going on with residential, commercial, industrial customers, right? That's, that's the whole world of what could be true. That's the vision. That then comes to me. My job is I'm the architect. I'm here to describe what this house will look like in 2050. I'm here to come up with a wild idea for all the things that could be true for our customers to meet our vision. We then that, give that to our modeling and analytics team. That's like a civil engineer. They basically say, okay, architect, you have a great vision, but here's the blueprints. Here's how you really do it. We then give that to our conceptual design team. They're kind of like the general contractor. They kind of pull everything together say, and say, here's how we'll do it. I need a tile guy. I need to get, you know, flooring, I need to have a drywall guy, I need to put studs up, here's the permit that, that I need to get. So that's kind of how this whole process works together. That's the process that we're deploying. And the idea here is as you work through this, we'll create a shovel ready project that is future proofed, represents the right no regrets investments, and is something that operations can deploy fungibly to meet all of our needs, right? We can't keep up fast enough. We're gonna invest, you know, 500 billion a year into this, into this energy economy. I mean, that's a burn rate of, 10, $20 million a day in every single state across the country to be successful here. So we have to create this machine. I should have given you a time warning, but we're out of time. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So with that, I'll, I'll end on this. This is just a vision real quick in 10 seconds of what this integrated model looks like. I think this will resonate with a lot of you. I think most of you know what a lot of these products are, working from bulk system to reliability to production costing and then power flow, integrating with electric and gas back to back. So this is a vision of what it looks like. Uh, we're still working on this, actually something I'm working on with eSig as well right now. So more to come. So with that, I'll hand it back to you, Leah. Thank you, Steve. So Steve, you said um, Excel Energy has some of the best natural resources in the country in your footprint, but here to give you a run for your money, Ms. Prabhu from ERCOT, which is very rich in both wind and solar resource. Um, Prabhu is the director of grid planning at ERCOT. Um, he spends his days thinking about large loads, interconnections, which you also do, Stephen, um, transmission planning, gen mix changes, and uh, the interconnection queue. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Leah. Uh, morning, everyone. It's going to be hard to follow Steve here. You know, I, I I'll try to keep my do my best here. So I guess you know I I you know I really enjoy coming here to ESEG. I've been here before. Uh, there are great panel sessions here, uh, talking about all kinds of problems. Uh, me being an engineer, I love like you know solving problems. That's what uh, we are all trained for. Not only solving problems, we we are trained to find problems. So. The, the only place that has backfired is, uh, is probably in my personal life. When I have conversations with my wife, she, she keeps telling some problems, you have to just listen. <laughs> when I try to solve those, I get into problems. So anyway, so I guess, I guess this, uh, just, to, just to follow the, some of the conversation or the presentation that you heard from Steve. Um, so I'm gonna walk through three things that's happening in the industry. Um, so there's, there's a lot of change happening uh, especially I'm going to focus on ERCOT uh, in terms of uh, changing resource mix, 
how the loads are changing and some of the planning process that uh, evolves with those changes. And also identify with those changes. Uh, there are several issues. We talk as an industry, try to address those uh, challenges, whether it's integration of large renewable resources and adding large loads to the system, all those different things. And the last, last part of my presentation, I'm gonna touch some of the things that's uh, happening on the legislative side, especially with the NERCOT that, that impacts planning. Okay, with that, uh, we'll get out this here. So, um, Steve, Steve talked about how, how, the, how the system has evolved and the industry has changed in a long time. So, if I look back in my career, you know, I started almost like three decades ago. Uh, when I started, we, we had a system which is pretty much, you know, well defined in the sense like where the large, the, the, the basic concept of the system was we have like large generation sites in the large load centers and we have transmission serving that loads. So um, back then in the 90s, people who are old enough knows that, you know, the industry was pretty much, you know, gotten ahead of solving all the problems. Um, then in the last uh, few years, you all know that like how the system has evolved. I'm gonna to touch some of those things. This is some of the facts about ERCOT. Um, we set a peak load of 80, roughly over 85 gigawatts last year. Um, and in terms of uh, generation, we have 103 gigawatts of installed capacity. Um, the breakdown of the wind, solar, and uh, batteries are listed here, 38 gigawatts of wind. That's the most of uh, any states in US. And I think we are 22 gigawatts of solar. Um, I think we are leading in terms of solar as of last year, when you just consider the utility scale solar. So California has more uh, PVs, I guess. So last bit is like the batteries is, you know, five gigawatts of batteries um, installed on our system as of today. So you do see that uh, we hit like uh, several, several records in terms of uh, wind penetration and solar penetration. Um, just to moving ahead. So this is how our system used to look in, 20, in, in, in the 2000. So in terms of generation capacity, majority of that is uh, natural gas and coal. And moving today, you could see the capacity installed capacity roughly around 38% is solar and wind and uh, batteries of, uh, roughly around five giga. So this is how the load has changed the bottom. We moved from a 57 gigawatts to 85 gigawatts, roughly a 48% increase. So if, you, if I focus on this uh, changing uh, generation resource mix, especially looking at the IBRs, um, you could see that where we are, like the transition that happened in the last five years is pretty, pretty rapid within ERCOT. Um, so solar, five years back, we were six gigawatts. So right now we are like, uh, as I said, 20, 22 gigawatts. And the projection is to go to 49 gigawatts by 2025, based on what we have in the queue. Uh, when this kind of flat wood is, it's, uh, it's roughly around, if you look at the projection 2025, it's uh, 42 gigawatts and the batteries are supposed to significantly increase um, going from five gigawatts or close to five gigawatts to 18 gigawatts uh, end of 2025. So that's, that's the kind of transition that we are seeing in our cut. So capacity wise, we're moving from 62 gigawatts of installed IBR capacity to close to a 110 gigawatts of installed capacity by 2025, at least the projections. Um, to complicate stuff, you see that there is uh, 37 gigawatts of um, dispatchable generation, thermal generation that's planned to retire or it's already retired in the system. So this is how our queue looks. Um, if you look in a connection queue, we have uh, roughly around 1800 uh, projects or interconnection requests, uh, 350 gigawatts of generation in the queue. Uh, most of them, the breakdown is solar is 152 gigawatts and battery is 140 gigawatts. So roughly around more than 80% of the queue is predominantly solar and battery. Uh, you can find those information uh, additional. If you need breakdown of details, you can follow this link. I hope at some point this presentation will be available so people we're taking pictures, don't worry that uh, we can share this. This is public presentation. Uh, a little bit more on the distributed uh, generation side. Uh, we do see increase in uh, PV penetration. Uh, right now we have uh, closely around uh, four, I think uh, 3,800 megawatts of DG 
which looking at the projections, if you look at aggressive PV, it's going to go to seven gigawatts and, and a moderate or a conser you know, conservative approach is 4.4 gigawatts. So the breakdown of the DGs are given here. I'll talk about it a little bit next slide, the breakdown of different DGs. Uh, EVs, uh, we did some studies um, and see that EVs projections, it's not very significant. Uh, looking at uh, 2030, we expect roughly around 900 megawatts of our total loads uh, driven by the EV charging. Again, uh, there is a separate panel. You all heard discussions on the DG. There will be more discussions there, but this is how we break down DG in terms of uh, ERCOT. There are so many acronyms within ERCOT. People who are following ERCOT, you know, discussions will know. So there is like, you know, DG, settlement only DGs and all this registered, unregistered. So this is a breakdown of like, you know, how we treat. So basically on your left, the unregisters are your solar rooftop panels, which is like one megawatts or less. And then there are registered, which is greater than 10 megawatts. Uh, so there are, there are different different categories within that, as I said, uh, SODG, which is settlement only distributed and then distributed GGs. Uh, we do have a strong demand response program. Um, we do have like load acting as resource. There are several several batteries participating in the, those kind of, those ancillary services. And I'm not going to get into too much details there. You'll probably hear in those other presentations. This is a challenging part: load growth. Um, uh, in this slide, I'm just only talking about large loads, what we call large loads within ERCOT. Uh, this has been an issue starting sometime very recently, last uh, three, four years. Uh, prior to that, we had our interconnection process. We were able to incorporate large loads through our normal planning process. But uh, what changed in 2002 is uh, influx of large data centers and crypto loads that uh, wanted to connect with the NERCOT. So we have been working with our stakeholders to define these loads because the, the pace at which these loads interconnect is and the timelines are really short. You're talking about, you know, anywhere from eight to 18 months or 20 months, less than 20 months for these large loads. And these are like huge loads. If somebody who knows the data center loads, you could connect like 151, probably like four kilowatts. You add the math, you're looking at like, you know, several hundred gigawatts or megawatts of load. So we came up with the process. We define anything greater than 75 megawatts as large loads. Um, and we've been tracking, we've been trying to change our protocols to address those. Um, so uh, right now we have uh, close to four gigawatts already connected to the system and short-term projections, you can see what's in our queue, uh, 25 gigawatts of this load. This is just the large loads. Uh, this contains uh, data centers, crypto loads, hydrogen loads, all those loads. Uh, but in addition to that, we are also seeing tremendous load growth, uh, especially in West Texas, oil and natural gas loads. Um, so just to give you an idea, last year, last planning cycle, our planning cycle looks at six years out. So last year, when we did the studies, 2029, our load projection for the furthest year was 120 gigawatts. And there were some changes in the legislation. There was House Bill 5066, which passed, which asked us to plan for projected loads, plus also the loads that doesn't have like interconnection agreement. So this planning cycle, looking at 2030, our planning projection is 160 gigawatts. So compared to last year to this year, we have additional 40 gigawatts, which we need to plan the system for. This is, this is a good problem to have, but it's just not something you wanna have when you're running out of generation or capacity. So this is our planning cycle. I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time. Uh, we divide into six years and anything beyond six years is our long-term. We do different things, regional planning, uh, long-term planning in the last one is uh, we, we also do a resiliency planning, which is the why annual. I'll talk about it in a few slides down there. So this slide, I captured the, the key challenge between the generation and transmission timelines. So traditionally you could see the construction time for generation has been, you know, three years, four years to go to the interconnection process. And you would have time to plan the transmission system. You do the studies, you put the projects in place and you get this projects on time. Uh, the current situation is the generation I, IBRs, they're connecting you know, anywhere from 18 months to even shorter for batteries. So that process provides this challenge where 
the planning process has to evolve, right? You know, we're still doing the studies, the construction times, when you add, it, add in the supply chain challenges and all those things, it's still going to take similar time or more. So then you have to deal with the system congestion until, you, until the transmission catches up with the system. So uh, changing topics here, IBRs, uh, I'm going to lay some of the issues. Uh, you probably heard or seen a lot of those uh, reports, especially the NERC reports. Uh, there were three events with the NERC card. Uh, Odessa, one in, two in Odessa, one in Panhandle. Uh, those events, especially, you know, normal faults in the system that tripped uh, um, several, several thousand megawatts of uh, in renewable resources, uh, which, is, which is not supposed to be happening because they should be able to ride through these events, but, you know, they didn't. So following that, we've been spending a lot of time Looking at IBR issues, um, I don't have to. I don't. I'm, I don't have to. You know, lay out all these issues. You'll probably hear in the next panel or the next discussions talking about oscillations and other things. But some of the issues are mainly driven by the low system strength, inertia, and uh, right through issues. So how do we address? Like you know, in terms of modeling, uh, the models are getting more complex. We're not just looking at steady state. We are. We can solve this using the the traditional dynamic studies, transient stability, you have to go to more like the EMTP kind of studies, uh, which we try to do and we integrate into our planning process. So not only that, you have to also do, modeling is the key for this, right? You have to constantly keep working on your models, update, uh, make sure the models are accurate and validate those models based on real-time events and things like that. All these things are going with the NERCOT. There's many panels, several technical discussions happening around this. So uh, we try to resolve those issues related to IBRs. We look at holistically and see, you know, not only this models, this not, you know, the resource entities problem or transmission problem, you have to look at the holistic solution. So we do everything like on the resource side, people have to utilize this capa capability of those resources, whether it's like grid farming technology or all those things, uh, better models and right through all those things needs to happen on the resource side. But on the, the transmission side, we also try to improve the system step. One such project is the synchronous condenser project, uh, which was approved last year. We proposed six synchronous condensers, 350 megawatts, every MVA capacity each. And uh, if you look at the specs, we're also requiring the synchronous condensers to bring some inertia to the system. So where uh, these synchronous condensers proposed will have a flywheel, which can store the inertia and provide this relief when the system needs it. Uh, I think this is, uh, this is pretty new to the industry. So I'm gonna move on to a few things that's happening on the legislative side. Um, so since we had the URI event, Winter Storm URI, so there's been several bills passed in, Earth, in the Texas legislation that impacts planning. One such thing is the grid resiliency. Uh, this one requires ERCOT to consider resiliency as a factor in planning. So this is the definition of the bill, what, what, what needs to be considered. In addition to doing your traditional reliability economic planning, the resiliency part needs to be added. Uh, we need to produce a biannual uh, study and propose any resiliency projects that would fit in this criteria, which is basically looking at um, different levels of changing thermal and renewable generation uh, and weather conditions, and also come up with planning projects that would improve the system resiliency. So the first such report is due end of this year. Um, there's also a couple of things. One is related to the economic planning criteria. Um, they introduce a new test, which is uh, you know trying to catch the congestion cost test because ERCOT, we had a lot of congestion in the system. So this is a new criteria that was you know that we are in the process of implementing. Um, there is a lot of presentations. If uh, if you click on that, we will get some highlight or reference to the presentation. So basically what we are looking at is, uh, is a system-wide grass load uh, cost test. We already have the production cost test, but this is addition to that. So with that, I'm gonna stop and I'll be you know, looking forward for all the questions and discussion. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. We will have questions at the end of uh, the other panels. So thank you very much. This is really fascinating. I'll, that is a big growth for ERCOT. That is, anytime I see it, I'm just like, wow. And, and this, the amount of solar coming on just this year 
is very impressive. Uh, the the ability for ERCOT to get projects through the queue is is just really fast. Like I think one of the fastest um, queues in in the United States uh, to get projects through. So, um, but it is creating challenges on the transmission side. So that, that's fascinating to see those those timelines. Um, pattern is very um, aware of how long it takes to build transmission projects. So that hits close to home for me. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're moving on to Jeremy. Um, Jeremy is a uh, principal at Evolved Energy, um, and he's going to be discussing, um, you know, the benefits of sector coupling, um, kind of going through a use case with hydrogen, and you know how we can kind of leverage complementary attributes of different technologies. So, um, thank you, Jeremy. Great. Thanks very much, Leah. Uh, so I'm going to take a detour into the more conceptual side of things and, and think about planning paradigm itself. And as the slide suggests here, I'm talking about cross-sectoral analysis and specifically how that applies in a, a low carbon or, or, or a net uh, zero carbon world going forward. Um, you know, the planning for a zero carbon economy when we're thinking about emissions from all sectors, including electricity, but also various types of fuels, it looks a bit different from planning just for clean electricity. So clean electricity is a really important part of a, a zero carbon economy, but we have all of these other emissions we need to deal with. And so thinking about what are the strategies there that make the most sense and how does that interact with our electricity grid is, is part of thinking about this in a, a cross-sectoral way. Uh, so I will just skip right to the end and, and talk about conclusions here. Uh, integration across sectors of the economy is, is really important um, to capture both realistic pathways to these net zero future goals, and also thinking about what are the most cost-effective ways to uh, reach our emissions targets in the future. Um, so what I will do here is, is lay out why we think this, and I think I'll probably be preaching to the crowd here, and then get into some challenges and opportunities at the end that might uh, uh, develop some discussion. A little bit about evolved energy research, first of all. So we focus on policy and strategy questions raised by transformation of our energy system. And what that really means is for our clients, uh, utilities, uh, state planners, developers, investors, it's about answering the, the near-term questions. What are the decisions that they should make right now in the context of increasing uncertainty as we go out into the future? Um, and also in the context of knowing that we're on this path to get to net zero goals in the future. And there are many ways that we can walk that path. Uh, what are the ways that are going to serve us best? So it's about putting our best foot forward. Uh, a big part of that is thinking across all sectors of the economy. Um, the questions that, that we've been answering have kind of evolved over time, um, where we've moved into this space where before we were thinking much more uh, siloed, thinking about electricity, um, thinking somewhat in other sectors, but they've, they've really been behind the curve uh, when it comes to decarbonization. But now when we're working with state planners, for example, most of the studies that we're doing are focused economy wide. And so looking at emissions targets in the future and what sort of strategies are going to best serve the state for uh, risk reduction, for uh, cost containment and achieving the various objectives that a state has set out as part of their plan, which are economic, but also include a variety of other goals that are factored into uh, planning for this low carbon future. Okay, so thinking about sectoral coupling from the electricity sector, what does this mean? Uh, so the way that we're defining it here is growth of non-traditional electric utility loads. And the electricity sector is central to achieving our economy-wide emissions reductions. It's really the linchpin to all of the activities uh, that we forecast going on. Um, and that's because it's the lowest cost zero carbon energy. And so you're going to want to do electricity solutions before you, want to, you would want to decarbonize fuels, for example. Um, 
So sectoral coupling opportunities in electricity involve direct electrification of end uses, like in transportation and buildings, novel electrification of industrial processes, such as production of steam or thermal energy storage, uh, and the use of electricity to synthesize fuels. So hydrogen production, and then the various things that you can do with that hydrogen down the supply chains. Uh, so we need to recognize that these new loads, they can look pretty different than traditional loads. You want to put them in different places. They have different flexibility characteristics. And this opens up to us various different opportunities that we could take advantage of going forward that could reduce our costs in the future. Um, so as an example here, I just put up hydrogen supply chain. Uh, electricity goes into the electrolyzer, we get hydrogen. It can go into a variety of different um, processes. So methanation and dropping into a gas pipeline, direct hydrogen delivery to end uses, so fuel cells or industrial processes, uh, fissure tropes, conversion into liquid fuels and production of drop-in fuels for transport and other parts of the economy, and a Haber-Bosch process for ammonia. And you could replace traditional uses of ammonia, or you could use it for uh, novel new fuels, and the maritime sector looks like a promising opportunity there. So when we're thinking about planning our energy economy, then we're also, we need to think about what do we invest in these various different supply chain components? So we, we, we maybe are purchasing a commodity, we have fuels conversion processes, we have uh, delivery through pipelines or otherwise, we have storage um, of, of those fuels. And all of these things are just like electricity planning. How much do we invest in? What, when, and where are the kind of questions that we're, uh, we're answering? And so we need to factor this in when we are planning economy-wide and trade off solutions in one part of the economy versus others, depending on what their costs look like and what their, their relative attributes are. Um, a quick word on the way that we do this, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but we build up this bottom up picture of our uh, energy demand economy. And that's all of the air conditioners, all of the, the vehicles, all of the industrial processes in the economy. And that gives us a demand for all of these various types of fuels. Uh, some of these are assumptions that are going into our modeling that makes the most sense for things on the customer side, for example. Some things are optimized. Industrial processes are often something that economics are dominant there. So we include that in our optimization modeling. Um, and all of this comes into a, a uh, capacity expansion model that looks economy-wide at what kind of investments we should make, when we should make them, uh, and, and where those investments go. Just as an example of the transformation of our economy-wide economy -wide planning, uh, 2021 is there on the left-hand side that's pretty familiar, and the, the bar to, to focus on here is that orange bar that's about halfway along the page at the top uh, where we have electricity and where that electricity is going. So we have electricity demand going into buildings, into industry, and that's a, a pretty familiar picture um, because that's how we operate our system today. If we go to 2050, now electricity has, has taken a much larger role in the economy and we have building loads that have, have grown. We've replaced pipeline gas in buildings. Uh, we have electricity going into to boilers in industry. We have direct use of electricity in industry in greater quantities. And we have that, that electrolysis bar there where we're producing hydrogen and hydrogen is going into various types of fuels production or direct use in the economy. The simple example that I have here is, is kind of a conceptual one that we put together a couple of years ago just to illustrate this point. And this was prior to IRA, so I wouldn't focus on the numbers here and just think about uh, what the takeaways are. I will compare three different scenarios, a clean electricity policy, a clean electricity policy with high electrification, and a zero carbon economy just to show the differences between the decisions that we might make under, under these different regimes. So first of all, 
looking at electricity load, non-traditional load growth with tightening emissions targets, we see in the, the clean electricity case, uh, we just see load growth happening because of population growth and industrial output growth. High electrification, we see that greater level of demand because now we have more electric vehicles and we have more demand in buildings for electricity. But then in the zero carbon economy, we get that same level of electrification, but now it's, it's part of the, the lower, lowest cost solution to be thinking about producing fuels with our electricity sector. And this drives even higher uh, loads. Um, and, and this is, it's all about trade-offs here you know, we could have taken a pathway where we're going with biofuels on, on the decarbonizing fuel side of things. Uh, we could have taken a pathway where we didn't electrify as much, but these are more expensive solutions based on today's cost forecasts. Second here is electricity generation, and there's a lot going on here, so we'll just focus on some key takeaways we see by 2050 in all of our cases that we're going to a, a, a pretty high renewable content uh, in our portfolio. We have some gas with CCS in our clean electricity and high electrification cases. But the notable point here is that renewable cur curtailment is relatively high in both clean electricity and high electrification because we don't have a lot to do with the, the, the excess generation. We can put it into storage but building more storage is expensive. And so there is a economic trade-off point there where it's cheaper just to curtail that rather than to store it. In the zero carbon economy, again, we have this very high renewable system, but we see less renewable curtailment in this case because now we have these new industrial flexible loads where we're producing hydrogen. We can produce that hydrogen flexibly because based on the, the economics of building electrolyzers and building out the supply chain, it's more cost effective to be building over capacity on the electrolyzer side so that we can produce lots of hydrogen when we have lots of renewables available, and then we can back that off at other times. And so this gives us new opportunities for the electricity sector and balancing the electricity sector. A simple example of an average 2050 daily supply and demand, generation is on the top, and load is on the bottom. And so we see this solar dominant system where we have a lot of solar in the middle of the day, we have storage discharging into the shoulder periods to, to meet our load. Um, and then on the load side, we see energy storage in the middle of the day where we're storing all of that solar. In the zero carbon economy case, we see this, this increase in hydrogen production during the middle of the day to take advantage of that excess uh, energy availability, and then we back it down uh, towards the end of the day. And this is a strategy that, you know, it would make sense in 2050. Right now under IRA, the, uh, the cost equation looks different because if you're a hydrogen uh, developer or, or operator, you don't want to be that $3 a kilogram. And so you may be operating less flexibly, that economic balance point is shifted, but post IRA, this is the kind of world that makes sense for hydrogen operations. So we have all of these different balancing strategies and along the top are the traditional ones, uh, electricity generation. You know, a lot of, a lot of um, cost economies can be realized by putting generation in the right places, getting complementarity between uh, resources in different locations, electricity storage, uh, gas, so gas available for those times when you have low renewable output, you see the shift happening from an energy resource early on into a capacity resource later, and then into regional transmission. But if we look at the balancing of these, these new options that are available to us in, a, in an interconnected economy, we can look at the bottom row there. So the first chart there shows non-thermal net load. So that's load minus renewables. And you see in, in the three days that we pulled here, for the most part, we have more renewables available than we have load on those days. So what do we do with that load? And the next chart, balancing resources, shows us curtailing a little bit, but ramping up electric boilers. So dual fuel electric gas boilers switching to electric because prices are uh, favorable at that time fuel production, storage, and flexible loads. 
And then the next chart is residual load. So what are we doing uh, with our thermal resources? We have a little bit of, of thermal operations in these days to ensure that we have a reliable system. Uh, and then the last chart here, 2050 daily Southwest US electrolysis. This is over 365 days in uh, 2050 and showing the seasonality. So everything else here, we've, show, we've really been talking about diurnal balancing, but with renewables, we have these medium-term and long-term uh, requirements as well. And electrolysis provides us this, this great resource for that. Um, because if you think about what the cost of storage is in that paradigm, it is the cost of storing a liquid fuel in probably existing storage. And that outcompetes any sort of long-term storage or other types of energy storage. Um, and so it gives us this very valuable balancing resource for a, a seasonal uh, renewable system. Um, and that, this is basically making that same point. We have wind and solar. These are, these are the, the lowest cost primary energy supplies uh, that we can potentially deploy at large scale in a, a, a clean energy future. Um, we can couple fuels with electricity and that unlocks this large scale low cost storage for the electricity system. Um, and the bottom chart here on the right is, is a more near term kind of balancing opportunity where, uh, you know, hydrogen production is not always super flexible. In terms of producing liquid fuels, it is because we have this very cheap or close to zero cost storage that would be available for liquid fuel. But direct use of hydrogen, there is a demand, and that demand happens day in, day out, and storage of hydrogen is expensive. Um, an example of that is refinery operations and demand for hydrogen refineries. And this just shows that you know, if you have a, a, a strike price at which it starts to make sense to be producing hydrogen, then you can turn on the electrolyzer. When that doesn't make sense, then you've got steam methane reforming. So that's a, a more near-term way of, of uh, balancing with electrolysis. This slide seemed like a good idea when I put it in the presentation, but it's too complicated, so I'm not gonna go through it. It's, and everybody can look at it afterwards. I will just say that um, this slide is, is the one that is, is very much out of date. Um, and so I would, I would urge people, if they're interested in, in looking at hydrogen, carbon management and biomass here um, and the source and how it's used to go to our newer annual decarbonization perspective um, because that factors in IRA and a lot of more updated assumptions. So to round this out, let's think about some new challenges and opportunities that this gives us. So first of all, an economy-wide approach is needed to plan for electric load growth and operations when targeting a a zero carbon economy. Um, and the, the questions there are, are really, what are the regional implications of fuel and electric, electric sector coupling? Uh, these opportunities present themselves in a variety of different ways. So if we think about geography, where you produce fuels, where you produce hydrogen is really where you have high quality renewables because pairing those two things together uh, is going to be more cost effective than building transmission to hydrogen production somewhere else. Um, and so thinking about what are those opportunities on the grid really shifts our, our thinking about uh, planning. And uh, it's not always that we have nice, easy access markets next to those places either. And so what are the products? How are those going to get delivered to loads? Um, we can start thinking about a competition, wires versus pipes. We heard a lot yesterday about how it's really hard to build transmission. Um, and maybe there are opportunities where building transportation of other types of fuels is more competitive than building large scale transmission. Uh, so in our newer work, we, we build a lot of energy parks where we're pairing renewable generation with hydrogen, with other conversion processes and, uh, and other industrial loads. And those are either weakly connected or not connected to the grid. Um, and that might be transient, where in the near term, there may be major transmission obstacles to connect resources into the grid. And so a near term hydrogen product with the IRA incentive 
might be a way of, of uh, using those renewables more effectively. Um, and then we need to understand new opportunities and the speed of change so that we can future-proof our investments and, and manage risk going forward. Um, we need to explore the trade-offs between strategies that incorporate low growth, clean fuels, carbon management, electrification opportunities, and new industry. And I will, I will leave you with two animal-related challenges here. The first is the chicken and egg challenge. So what comes first? And we, we see this in, in electricity already with, with transmission and building renewables, particularly when it's multi-jurisdictional. What comes first, the transmission or the renewables? That's very difficult. Uh, when we start to think about this economy-wide and these other types of supply chains that are providing uh, clean fuels, then we need to start to identify what are the weak links in those chains? What are the feasibility challenges? What are the economic challenges? And perhaps direct our, our policy and, and decision-making towards trying to overcome those. And the final one here is, is whack-a-mole. So doing less in one part of the economy requires doing more in another. And part of the advantage of thinking about this economy is that we can look at the trade-offs between doing something in one part of the economy versus doing something in another part of the economy. We can also look at this in terms of the value of overcoming some of our challenges. And transmission is a good one. Siting and permitting is the, is the biggest uncertainty and the biggest, uh, the thing that moves the needle most on what we build and where and when. Um, but, uh, if we don't pursue that, then this kind of analysis tells us what are the consequences of not pursuing it. And maybe that leads us to feasibility challenges where we can't locate renewables at a fast enough rate close to load uh, or other things, cost impacts. And so it's a useful paradigm for uh, comparing and understanding the costs and feasibility consequences of our decision making. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, it's exciting to think beyond just the electricity sector and see what kind of benefits there are, um, you know, with the sector coupling, um, especially with hydrogen, which is a, a big topic um, and lots of changes going on there. Uh, next is Carlo. I think a lot of you know Carlo. He's been an ESIG attendee for quite a while, and um, he's uh, the CEO and co-founder uh, co of Encord, and he'll be going through. Um, you know, finding the right technology for the right problems in terms of battery storage, right? I think you go through a use case for batteries. He got his slides in way ahead of time, so I had tons of time to review them. <laughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Leah. And uh, I want to start by saying it's really a pleasure to come to EZIG every time. I agree with Steve that the power sector is the most important sector the most important electricity is the most important product of our society. And when I hear Jeremy's presentation, I realize how, how much work we all need to do in the next 26 years to potentially achieve this net zero world that we are all hoping for and envisioning. And it's daunting and scary to, to realize how much change needs to happen. At the same time, when I see Prabhu's presentation and I see what change air code went through from 2000 to 2024 in just 24 years, that gives me hope that together we can really make certain change happen. And uh, what I like about TZIG is the diversity in disciplines that it attracts. And I don't know a better forum than EZIG that has been going on for 35 years, bringing all these dis different disciplines that help plan and design the transition to a different future. So it's a pleasure and an honor, and I want to thank Leah and Isaac for the invitation to be here. Today I'm going to talk That was to... really nice, Carlo. I just want to say, I don't know if... Thank you. Charlie's probably crying back there somewhere. It's very sweet. Today I will talk to you about decoupling the value of energy storage. And I want to tell two stories about this. One is talking about decoupling the energy charging and discharging capacity of storage technologies. This is something I've been thinking 
about over uh, the last several years. And what I will present to you today is a very simple analytical exercise, trying to understand what are the values of energy, what is the value of charging, and what is the value of discharging. The next thing I'm gonna talk about in terms of decoupling value of storage is what are the different values or what is the value stack that storage can bring to the power system as well as to the owners and operators of these storage assets. So let me start first talking to you about decoupling energy charge and discharge. And so again, this is a simple exercise, but it has helped me a lot understanding how these three important parameters or characteristics of any storage asset influence its value from an energy and firm capacity or capacity perspective. So not looking at other services that storage can provide, which I will touch on later. Imagine you are a utility or you are an industrial uh, entity and you have a demand of electricity of 10 megawatts in average throughout the year. So you're consuming 87,600 megawatt hours a year. Now you are connected to the grid and you can buy electricity for $50 a megawatt hour, but you're getting charged on your peak, peak annual consumption and your peak capacity cost is $250,000 per megawatt. You install a large PV plant because you want to decarbonize your electric supply. So you have a 20 megawatt solar plant. You know that you can reduce your cost. Well, you assume you have the hypothesis that you can reduce your total electricity costs and increase the penetration of renewables by installing storage. But you don't know how much. And you get to choose how much capacity and how much energy your storage uh, asset will have and the storage will will have a cost for energy and a cost for capacity you're going to pay $225,000 per megawatt for capacity $230,000 meg, uh, uh, per megawatt hour of energy so let's imagine you are in Seattle and this is a Seattle's um, load demand curve for the year as you can see it peaks in the winter and is lowest uh, during the summer. And you have a peak demand of 16.8 megawatts. Remember that the average demand is 10 megawatts, but it peaks at 16.8. Capacity factor for PV is 23%. Now let's imagine instead you are in Phoenix where your electric demand peaks in the summer, your capacity factor of PV is much higher, it's 32%. And now let's imagine you are in Miami, where demand also peaks in the summer, but it's not as peaky as in Phoenix, it's more constant throughout the year, and you have a capacity factor of PV of 27%. In, all, in each of these circumstances, what will be the optimal storage device you will install? And let's imagine, let's start with Seattle, and let's imagine the only technology you have available to install is a four-hour battery, because that's what today is mostly commercially available. In Seattle, you will build a 14.5 megawatt hour battery. That will be the optimal design for this example. And that will increase your PV penetration from 34% to 39%. And it will reduce your peak grid demand that you're paying a capacity payment on from 16 megawatts to under 14 megawatts. If you are in Phoenix though, you will be a much larger battery. And the only change between Phoenix and Seattle is the shape of your demand and the solar resource. But you can see how locationally dependent the value of storage is, where in, Seattle, in Phoenix you will be a battery that is twice the size. That will obviously increase PPV penetration and decrease the peak grid demand significantly. But the way these cost assumptions we used in this simple analysis uh, come from NREL's uh, annual technology ba uh, baseline cost projections and take into account IRA incentives as well. So we try to keep the analysis as realistic as possible. And then if you are in Miami, as you see, you're gonna build a battery that is more or less in the mid, in between what you will be in Seattle and, and Phoenix. Now, what if, we were able 
to decouple our energy charge and discharge capacities. What if we had an, a storage technology where the duration of the storage is customizable and where charging capacity and discharging capacity can be different? The reason I started thinking about this is because we've been working with several long duration energy storage technology like liquid air energy storage, where that is indeed true, where when you build a liquid air energy storage technology, uh, a liquid air energy storage asset, you can decouple the capacity of the energy, the capacity of the charge, and the capacity of the discharge, because the, the charge is primarily compressors, the discharge is a turbine, and then the storage is literally uh, reservoirs, containers where you store uh, air at, uh, at really high pressures and, and low temperatures. The cost assumptions for these newer technologies are hard to find. So we decided not to focus on that and assume the same cost technologies as for battery, but we allow the free on the optimization model to choose what is the optimal duration and what is the optimal ratio between charge and discharge. And what we see is that in Seattle, we will build same capacity, 14.5 megawatt hours, but there is more value in discharge than there is in charging capacity in, uh, in Seattle. And as we see, the impact of, P of PV penetration is not large, neither is the P grid demand, but we are able to build something more uh, that can reduce still the value or, or can increase the value of storage by customizing the ratio between energy charge and discharge. If we look at Phoenix though, we are, the, this flexibility increases the optimal storage size 2x, more than 50 megawatt hours. And what we see here also, the discharge is higher than charge. We have 7.8 megawatts of discharge, 6.4 megawatts of discharge. And on top of that, we have an increase in PV penetration and a further significant decrease in peak grid demand. If we look at Miami, we see very similar behavior, but to a lesser extent. So we looked at what is the value compared to the four hour storage. What is the value of this decoupling? The value of storage increases by 25, 28 and 19% respectively, purely from this decoupling. Obviously there are costs associated with this decoupling. I cannot assume that this decoupling comes on no cost. What those costs are depend on the technology. And so we didn't wanna focus on the different technologies. We wanted to understand, is there a potential value in this decoupling. And here is a demonstration of how that value exists, but is also locationally dependent. But then we said, well, what if instead of a local utility that has this variable demand that varies over throughout the day and throughout the year, we are an industry that has a constant demand. We are a steel manufacturer and we consume 10 megawatts of energy every hour of the year. How will the results change? So the optimal four hour storage will be significantly smaller, two megawatt hours. And uh, this storage will slightly uh, increase uh, the, the PV penetration and barely decrease the peak demand over the year. But then when we look at what will be the optimal energy charge and discharge capacities, we found something really interesting, which is you end up with a much longer duration, about 15 hours, as a function of discharge. And in this case, the charging capacity is significantly more valuable than the discharging capacity, which we found really interesting. So the customization of the storage, depending on what your needs are, in some cases, more charging capacity may be better than more discharging capacities. And in other cases, the opposite is true. And in this case, this decoupling has a significantly higher value uh, where it uh, increases the value of the storage from practically zero to $46,000 a year in this uh, simple example. So, as I said, there is a lot of storage technologies. Obviously, lithium ion batteries are the technology that is most broadly, uh, well, apart from pumped hydro, obviously, um, um, being installed today in. Uh, in power systems all around the world. But a lot of 
investment is going into developing other storage technology, especially in the long duration energy storage space. We've been working with liquid air energy storage technology companies, but th there is many others, especially in the United States, we're seeing a lot of companies being funded for energy is one example. And uh, these technologies differ not only in their ability or potential to decouple energy capacity and discharge, but they also differ in terms of lifetime, in terms of round trip efficiencies, differences there can be very large, in terms of obviously capital cost and operating cost, in terms of um, the, the applications for them. Some technologies are only relevant at very small scale, other technologies at very large scale. Some technologies are designed for short durations, other are designed for large duration. And, understanding how these technologies can bring different value in different scenarios and how they compete with each other is key and requires an integrated planning approach. And um, I wanna go into why integrated planning is necessary to quantify the value of storage. From a customer perspective, if you are, for instance, a residential or a commercial user, what you may care about investing in a small Tesla wall could be because you want to have some backup power during extreme weather events, or you, you need higher reliability of the electric uh, supply that you get in your house. You may want to take uh, um, advantage of time you, of use a uh, bill management, or you want to reduce your demand charge uh, reduction, or you want to fully uh, um, decarbonize and you want to take uh, advantage of higher uh, PV in, in your uh, home or, or your commercial or industrial um, facility. But if you are a system operator, where storage brings values in energy arbitrage, as we showed before, it could come from uh, other uh, uh, different types of ancillary services, so frequency regulation, voltage regulation, black start, inertia of the system. Different technologies are going to bring you different values depending on how they operate. And if you are a utility, storage can be extremely valuable to defer or avoid infrastructure cost uh, at the distribution level, but also at the transmission level. And uh, you know we've seen a lot uh, uh, from uh, Prabhu's presentation, the challenges of increasing transmission congestion as generation changes faster than transmission is storage, potentially a short-term solution to defer some of these transmission uh, investment uh, costs. And then certainly from a resource adequacy uh, perspective, storage can also bring a lot of value. The challenge is you, there is no magical model or no magical analytical framework that will tell you what the value of storage is or what all, how a, a specific asset can, how do you quantify all these different values for a specific asset? Or obviously not all of them, but a subset of them. And that's what we do at Anchored. Uh, Anchored is an integrated planning uh, solution company. And we are in the business of the arrows in the last uh, slide that Steve showed. We believe there is an increasing need in coordinating and integrated traditionally siloed planning processes, not to build a large model that can capture everything, but rather leverage the existing planning paradigms that exist today and finding ways for the planning teams and planning processes to talk to each other and learn from each other to be able to then quantify the trade-offs that exist when making an investment in storage or in anything else in terms of how they impact the, their cleaning, clean objectives, reliability objectives, and, and cost objectives. And I wanna give you two examples of where we are working with customers with respect to storage where integrated planning is bringing them value. We're working, as I said, with liquid air energy storage technology companies. They are um, running um, using our software saying capacity expansion and production cost models optimizations to understand what, are, what, what is the optimal sizing and what is the optimal way to operate different storage assets under different conditions, as well as then using dispa uh, optimal um, dispatch conditions that they get from the optimization models 
to run AC power flow simulation and understand how and if can technology also provide value from a voltage regulation perspective. Another example is we're working with electric utilities that need to plan for electrification. In other words, they need to plan for the increasing electric demand in their local distribution network that may come from heating, but it could also come from electric vehicles, data centers, et cetera. That is gonna require investments in both the distribution network and in the soft transmission network. They're gonna have to evaluate where do they need to upgrade service transformers, fuses, where do they need to upgrade substation um, uh, transformers, where do they need to upgrade uh, conductors. And they are able to not only run both power flow simulations at the distribution and transmission level to evaluate those infrastructure costs, they can also optimize what they call non-wire alternatives or storage technologies where that storage asset may actually reduce the peak consumption at the sub-transmission transformer or the, the, the peak thermal cap, uh, capacity or the peak thermal flow at the sub-transmission transformer such that they avoid upgrading that transformer that will save the millions at the cost of a cheaper storage technology. That is only possible if you are able to iterate between optimization models and physical network models and understand the trade-offs between physical impacts and techno-economic parameters that you want to take into consideration when making an investment. And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you.